Well, well, um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, my name's Tom Jenkins. I trust you've had a good half day. Uh, that marks the halfway point of this workshop. Um, I'm delighted to be joined um, at this break that we have um, by Eduardo Santander, who's the Chief Executive of the European Travel Commission, who um, is sitting in Brussels, and indeed, Brussels is where the headquarters of the European Travel Commission, or ETC, is based. Uh, good afternoon, Eduardo. Good afternoon, Tom. Thanks for having me. Not at all. Um, look, I, well, can you tell the audience a little bit about ETC? I mean, they are uh, famously one of the big promotional conglomerates for Europe, and particularly in North America. But uh, it would be good to hear a little bit about um, their history, what you do, and what you hope to do. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Uh, Tom, like the the ETC, the European Travel Commission, is a rather old organization, institution, if you want. Um, we were founded back in 1948, um, in the aftermath of the Second World War, from by some wise uh, people at that time that thought that tourism could be a catalyst for the economy, and um, it was de facto a big catalyst for the economy of uh, European countries, also for all um, the rebuilding uh, issues of of the of the economies but also you know the service industry in europe after the war um at that time and i have to say uh, start um underlining the importance of the american market at that time because the the very first activities of etc back in the 50s and back in the 60s were very much focused on the american market um, attracting uh, american operators and trade and also a lot of american um, visitors at that time, obviously baby boomers, and you know, like a, it was a very um, a booming market too. In in a sense of a, a, there was the the booming of aviation and um, to, to bring into Europe um, and for many different reasons. Uh, obviously, being part of the Marshall Plan, uh, ETC was founded with uh, money and funds from from the Marshall Plan, was a huge economic boost uh, for uh, for the economies of many countries. <laughs> That at that time, you know, uh, they were either developing tourism, or or you know, restructuring or rebuilding uh, whatever it was left after the war. So you see that uh, Tom, that um, the history between ETC or uh, the relation between ETC and and, and United States of America go uh, very back in time to the very uh, foundation of 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 ETC. Um, what do we do nowadays? Um, we cannot uh, live in the past, definitely, but uh, we um, do three major fields of, of work or um, we pay attention to, of obviously, a lot of market research that we do, among others, with ETOA, um, but also with other organizations such as United Nations World Tourism Organization, WTTC, and also run on um, and with other partners. Everything that we do then marketing wise is based on that market research. So we've uh, we do a lot of market trends and, and obviously now we're much focusing on uh, understanding um, what tourism is going to be and what are we heading to and uh, we cannot probably read the future. We cannot know the future, but definitely we can shape it, understanding uh, more, the, the more the trends and more how um, things are changing so so rapidly. And last but not least, and as Tom mentioned that we are based in Brussels, uh, that's for a very important reason, um, is for um, the proximity of the EU institutions and the policy making bodies here. We're here to influence them and to mitigate advantages for, for tourism and to obviously uh, push for um, advantages and, and, and obviously um, for good policies um, for the exchange between um, people and, and obviously for the freedom of travel. Oh, yeah, I mean, Eduardo, what, what, what uh, you pointed out, and I'd completely forgotten, was that um, ETC, and indeed the whole promotion of Europe in North America, uh, which was uh, spearheaded and funded by the Marshall Plan, was effectively um, money being provided by the United States government to promote Europe in North America. Uh, this was uh, a uh, almost an American subsidy for outbound travel. Um, how different from the previous administration in the United States? Don't see uh, Donald Trump having come up with that one, but we never know. You know, we, we live in a hope 
for Mr. Biden. Um, I think also, um, I mean, the points you were making um, about the importance of America uh, is, is of overwhelming relevance. I think the, um, from our point of view, and obviously ETOA is a, a private sector organization which um, is really a, a conglomerate of people who sell Europe as a destination anywhere in the world. Um, we have a, a coverage which is really global, courtesy of our members. But North America represents an overwhelming proportion of our business. Um, and I think from a European in, inbound point of view, I think it's fair to say that um, one year's fluctuation of business from North America and the point about America is that if the price is right, America travels. Um, one year's fluctuation will uh, equal all the business we get from China or Japan. So just a, var a variation will be more than the aggregate from our other important destinations. So North America is actually central to European inbound um, commercial viability. And is Precisely, it, uh, Tom. Precisely, yeah. it's the most important market uh, um, for Europe, uh, long haul market. Uh, by far, uh, we are not talking. You know, there's been a big buzz uh, with China, with uh, Southeast Asia, with the new upcoming markets. Uh, you know, like all the BRICS and so on in the in the last decade. But the reality, if you see it in very concrete, solid, and you know, like transparent numbers. United States is still by far the most important in both arrivals, in expenditure, and also in understanding and in building bridges when it's come to trade and, and tourism. Um, I think we speak not only the same business language, um, but there is a common culture which is shared here um, in, in terms of uh, what uh, does imply to, to be a tourist and, you know, or you know, to trade in tourism. Okay, so this well, is of, of important because there is this kind of... Uh, Sometimes uh, when we go to other markets, and yeah, having mentioned China, there is a uh, disbalance normally in what you know what is, what trading in tourism means in other markets. Whereas in the United States, as we are coming from there somehow, as we were explaining, um, there is um, a huge affinity between um, uh, what you know we expect here and what is expected also from a, um, a consumer point of view in the United States. And look, one thing I should have mentioned right at the beginning is that Eduardo here, as you know, um, uh, runs ETC, which is the umbrella body for all the national uh, tourism organizations in, in Brussels. Um, if you've got a question, either for myself or particularly for Eduardo, do pose it. You've got a chat bar on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, I can't actually see the questions the way we've structured it today, but I've got someone who can bring those questions into me. So if you've got any questions that you'd like to have answered, um, you know, what you think uh, national tourist offices do well, what you think they could do better, um, what you think, is, is, are they missing a trick? Should they work together more? Or should they concentrate on promoting individual destinations? Your opinion is actually really interesting. And if you could uh, phrase a question around your opinion, uh, we'd be delighted to answer it. So uh, send it in through the chat line there. Um, Eduardo, sorry, we were just talking about the importance of North America. Um, we've obviously seen a, a massive shortfall in North American business in uh, 2020. It, by my estimate, and that's just looking at what our members report to us, we've seen a roughly 90% drop in leisure travel uh, coming to Europe from North America. And that's a, almost an optimistic uh, proposal. There are many, many um, operators who are in the room or in the virtual room attending this workshop who will have seen a 100% shortfall in business. Um, I suppose the, the question that we've got to ask ourselves both as, an, as both organizations is what can we do to A, reassure clients and B, um, try and plot a way forward. I'll explain why I think that's really important, the plotting the way forward in a minute. But it'd be very interesting to hear from you what you think about client reassurance. Absolutely. I mean, um, without having full certainty, I'm pretty sure that, you know, international travel is going to come back by Q3 um, this year. So tourism is going to be back and it's going to bounce back um, pretty strong. Um, 
This is not uh, uh, something that I'm inventing, but it's something that our market research is telling us already. Uh, as we do conduct on a um, regular basis uh, a long haul travel barometer, uh, where we conduct different services in the North American market, and particularly, you know, in, in, in hotspots in where we know traditionally um, American citizens uh, come from when they when they when they travel to Europe. And there is not only a huge appetite, but there's also a changing appetite according to the, the current circumstances. And just to give you a couple, I have the, the research here open in front of me. Um, there is a huge trend now towards um, coast uh, line uh, destinations, coastal cities, also vibrant cities. And in very interesting that respondents seem keener to get a train pass rather than renting a car to move around in the future when they come. Um, but I prefer European countries because, uh, Tom, you will agree with me that uh, uh, when we talk about um, Europe as a destination, we are talking as, uh, you know, in pan-European package travel. Um, and the majority of it is, is still, um, um, it's a multi-destination travel, so it's a um, very important collaboration. It's something that uh, it is insist on. Um, pan-European product development. So when it comes, you know, to, to promote Europe, it's not only, uh, yes, a two, three destination, but it's a huge array of new upcoming and maybe um, trend, trendy destination. We see it in the perception of, of the American travel that there is a, a lot of new countries on, on the list popping up as, uh, as preferred destinations uh, for um, the last wave of this research that I'm referring to that covers Jan to, to April uh, 21 in terms of, of perception. And we see countries, you know, traditional countries as UK, France, Germany in the top three. But we see, for instance, you know, new on the list, Norway. We see also Poland, uh, probably uh, it's a lot of diaspora of, uh, of um, American cities with uh, Polish uh, background, you know, willing to come back home to visit uh, their families. We see also, you know, classic uh, um, countries such as Austria, Netherlands, Spain, and Italy has gone down. Maybe we we know why. Maybe it's the perception, the media perception, of of countries that haven't been done very well for a good while uh, during the pandemic. But I'm pretty convinced that uh, you know things will change uh, for for good. Also, you know, like we see numbers going down in practically every European country. We see that uh, the vaccination rollout, although slow, although with a lot of glitches, although with the whole logistic um, uh, challenges that, that it implies, it's starting to work, it's starting to reduce uh, the cases. Plus, um, obviously, the seasonality of the, of the uh, pandemic uh, uh, disease, as COVID-19 has demonstrated last year, that numbers will naturally go down in spring and summer, plus the um, uh, protocols, the safety protocols that will definitely remain in place for, for the summer, will definitely allow um, travel and tourism to restart um, this summer 2021, uh, not earlier. I'm, I'm pretty sure that this will not happen earlier. We also had very good news about um, uh, the um, deployment or the the approval of uh, um, what they call here in Europe the Green Pass. Um, this is something heavily supported by the European institutions and to be also approved and, and um, uh, by the member states of the European Union, especially for the Schengen zone, is you know the reality that for traveling in the in the foreseeable time, we will have to have an application, you know, telling if you have been vaccinated, and if not, it will not be discriminatory. It will show if you you have a, a negative test, um, you have passed a negative test, and any other information with, you know, obviously protecting your privacy and being non-discriminatory. This is a huge achievement because, Tom, you know, this is what we have been defended for months and uh, almost a year now. Coordination, harmonization, a clear picture. We don't want a puzzle of Europe again, especially in North America, um, when we know that the perception is as a, as a destination per se. So we don't want, you know, to 
uh, to have also just yes, pieces of Europe with a competitive advantage because they have been already vaccinated and other you know pieces of Europe in um, competitive disadvantages because you know maybe they haven't rolled out completely their vaccination program by the summer um, so again you know today I heard something very funny or very very interesting they say you know like uh, the proper use of mask um, protects you by 95 percent uh, against uh, COVID-19 and this is exactly the same percent that uh, you know the vaccination or the vaccine actually provides so again the combination of these three four factors are going to be uh, are going to make possible you know to to reopen europe probably uh, gradually as from now as from uh, beginning of the spring and easter uh, for intra european travel and then towards uh, summer and september uh, for international travel a big issue and i don't want to lie to you is the the mobility and aviation you know we know that um, aviation especially long haul heavily depends on 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 business travel you know to be uh, profitable and we see there a, a huge drop of uh, of um, of numbers uh, business uh, travel is something that it may change uh, drastically um for good and you know at least for for sure for the next years and as we know, those business travelers normally subsidize the price of the of the coach or, or the eco tariff of the eco rate. Um, and this is something which we are in, in conversation with the airlines, you know, to see how can we deal with, because um, obviously we want to avoid um, exorbitated um, uh, airfare um, for um, long haul uh, between United States and America both ways. So we need to find also a good compromise with them in, in a time uh, when we know that they are not doing well at all. So if I'm not so worried about uh, the perception from the consumer, I'm not about, I'm worried about you know, the rebounds of tourism, I'm much more um, preoccupied or uh, concerned about how the airlines will react to, to a sudden reopen of uh, uh, tourist uh, destinations and how do they um, calibrate the reopening of routes? And if the routes have been, are gonna be limited, if there's gonna be a drastic drop of uh, connectivity, we are working already on a contingency plan of mobility within the European Union so that we can uh, move around uh, with uh, you know, ground transportation, being train, being couch, being you know, private transportation like rent a car in a more comprehensive way and um, meaning in a seamless way you know through uh, applications and technology uh, solutions that will make uh, the american traveler feel much more welcome and make you know the whole experience very um, seamless on the positive note also to move around europe is going to be very possible again um, we've seen the report from low-cost carriers uh, within europe reporting that um, they're going to be fine again uh, as soon as people are able to um, to travel again. So, all in all, um, very mixed um, feelings about things, but I'm very optimistic since just a couple of weeks uh, as I see alignment finally within um, the different policy making bodies here and within the different um, uh, governmental entities and health authorities because until now there hasn't been much dialogue between health authorities and tourism authorities whereas now they see it as a principle of um, one of the bases of the pillars of the European Union and the Schengen is a free of mobility so they cannot uh, keep us home for much longer I would say <coughs> so Tom you know what you were saying reassurance 100% and now um, there is also um, at the NTO, at the National Tourism Organization level, there is going to be um, also a support level, you know, to um, operators uh, with a lot of, you know, including ETC, we have budgets ready to go the moment we can use them. And this will reflect in incentives, you know, to the trade, you know, to operators, you know, to help them uh, restart business with Europe. I can um, mention a couple by name, but you know we have also like a cooperation with the European uh, Commission um, uh, to support exactly flows, you know, from uh, long haul destinations, including the United States, to Europe as a part of the recovery plans um, um, uh, for the after COVID era in the European Union. 
So this is very much included and very much embedded in the in the recovery plans, you know, to help also um, operators and trade with different measures and different uh, uh, tools and 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 you know um, incentives, economic incentives, you know, to make the restart uh, fluid, uh, fluid, but also um, um, somehow sustainable in time too. It's something that you should not last only for a couple of years, but there is a clear message also from the European institutions that operators have to also look into their programs and start exploring Europe from a different way and, you know, to move on from uh, classic um, operation of big uh, hubs and, you know, uh, starting exploring lesser known destinations and also distributing the tourism flows in a more comprehensive way, which is obviously not alien to any of us as we have been doing that before COVID already. Mm -hmm. And we've been seeing trends also from United States moving towards Eastern Europe or Northern Europe and, you know, starting avoiding big, uh, big capitals or big um, um, hubs, as I was mentioned before. Hmm. No, I, I, Eduardo, you crowded a hell of a lot into that statement. I think, um, uh, you know, the, the, the good news, and you stress this, is that all the information we have is that demand is there. Um, the sectors that have been less affected by COVID-19 economically are the very sectors that we sell to in North America and indeed throughout the world. Uh, the professional classes that make up the vast bulk of the incoming tourists and indeed um, uh, and the student and youth market uh, they have not been affected economically by this crisis or they haven't been affected economically anything like as badly as other sectors so the uh, demand is there and the ability the financial ability to travel is there a uh, lift as you pointed out is a real issue but i think the moment the lift is in as long as, long as we've got some air capacity there I think we're going to see a reasonably rapid uh, return. Uh, as I keep repeating, I remember um, uh, Bob Whitley, of the chief executive of USTOA back in 2001, calling me triumphantly at the end of September of that year, immediately after the 9-11 atrocities, not immediately, but two weeks after the 9-11 atrocities, seven days after they had reopened the air travel between America and Europe, he said that one of his members was sailing Dublin for six nights, air inclusive, $499. He sold out within 25 minutes of the advertisement appearing in the New York Times. America travels if the price is right. And um, at the moment, we've got a comparatively strong dollar. Um, we've got an amazingly open uh, Europe for visitors to visit. Um, you will never see um, Rome, Florence, Venice. I hear your long-term plans, Eduardo, for spreading demand out uh, throughout throughout Europe to the lesser-known parts of Europe, which is a long-held uh, desire by the European Union and a long-held desire by every nation within Europe that they want tourists to go to different places from where the tourists want to go. But the good news is that at the moment, the honeypot destinations of Europe are desperate for business. And um, there will never be a better time to come to Europe than in the beginning of Q3 2021. It will be a fantastic time to be here. Anyway, um, I, I'm just wondering, um, are you, you mentioned that the European Commission you know, has, has got money there. Um, it's hoping to promote and assist travel into Europe. Uh, how is that going to, what sort of shape does that look like? What are, what are the proposals? What are the initiatives? Well, uh, there are different proposals. There are um, proposals which are very much operational. So some campaigns will be promotional campaigns and which are focusing more on the, on the marketing side of, uh, of Europe, partnering with uh, um, American tour operators and American companies. So, uh, you know, whoever sells Europe um, is very much welcome, you know, to join these campaigns. Second, there's going to be a B2B component uh, uh, where we're going to be reactivating the, um, the the trade while in, in, in 
creating uh, different marketplaces to connect uh, uh, buyers and suppliers again and probably also in partnership with you tom and etoa as an usdoa and uh, you know all uh, our partners uh, well established partners in, in in united states so the idea here is you know to reassure and also to to try you know to focus in what you know what is going to be working very good in these first months of restart because what we want to avoid is also the chaos of you know of having like this kind of desperation um, business, and there has to be like a, a, an order because this is the what the condition from the commission is. You know, you have to establish something which is also sustainable um, in the three layers of the sustainability. You know, from the economic point of view, from a social point of view, you know, like underlining you know what you were saying. You know, cities that used to be very full now, but that they are empty. How can we recalibrate? Uh, you know, those uh, indicators and see how can we get a better balance uh, balance between um you know local communities and visitors and last but not least obviously the environmental uh, part which probably will require uh, like a sensibility when it comes to sell um, and information um and obviously um there is a fourth layer which is the the post covid and and i know um, there is an initiative, you know, from ETOA, USTOA, and CATO. You know, the tour care guidelines. You know, we will probably want to be endorsing everything that makes uh, both, you know, like a supply and demand safe. Because as we have been told, um, COVID is gonna be here to stay for for uh, for a good while still after everybody is vaccinated. So, and um, you know, we want you we want to avoid this to happen again and also to be the scapegoat as we have been accused uh, from many uh, media groups you know of you know traveling and tourism has been the evil you know because we have been moving the virus around the world you know and unconsciously and uh, this is um, obviously not a very fair statement and, and I think you know the freedom of uh, travel and, and the freedom of movement is something so inherent to modern democracies and to advanced democracies and that you know while not being able to travel we see how limited we are um in all aspects of our of our lives and um, i think we have to reestablish also that kind of uh, um european uh, way you know we want to be you know an open continent we want to be uh, a seamless uh, a continent offering a seamless experience a safe continent you know and also a friendly when it comes you know to um you know to welcoming uh, people from the United States, you know, who, by the way, you know, it's it's something that you know it's pretty natural. Uh, the transatlantic relationships, you know, go beyond uh, even um, tourism. You know, it goes, you know, on cooperation in all in all fields. Uh, you know, and this is also something that the European Union would like to stress is, you know, the you mentioned the change of administration and tourism. And I be I had the pleasure to talk with uh, with also with. Um, uh, Roger Doe about this in a in a in a meeting with WTTC is this kind you know, of you know of transatlantic cooperation should go beyond you know like uh, um, any kind of tourism exchange, but you know we need to reestablish some kind of trust in um, both parts of the of the Atlantic because again, I always say a plane goes from A to B and from B to A, so I'm I'm sure also you know our American partners are willing to see European. Um, visitors back in the streets of New York, uh, and, parts of Florida and and you know in the casinos in Vegas. I have to, yeah, you're right. It's a two-way street, and America's got to start allowing people back into the states from Europe in order for them to send people to Europe. So it's a two-way reciprocity on restrictions as well. Um, I'm very conscious that we're now getting very close to the restart of the program. Um, Eduardo, um, I would just, one, one small benefit of um, what we've been through over the last 12 months is that tourism, even in the most tourist antip antipathetic cities that do not appreciate tourism, they appreciate it now. Uh, the central importance of the lifeblood of the city has been occurring, has been occurring very clearly, and North America is central to that equation. With that thought, I'll thank Eduardo and I will let you continue with your workshops. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'll see you at the end. Bye-bye.
Thank you, Tom.